Colossians tonight. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. 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 Colossians chapter 1.
I love you, Lord. So if we could open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Pretty sure, Callum. Colossians chapter 1. I'm only going to attempt to do the first 16 verses. That's all. Okay. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 answers a biblical question, why am I here? Colossians chapter 1 also answers the age-old question of why am I here? This is something that I've shared with the church before. Uh, when I was in college, when I was in a psychology class, they were talking about that very question. Why are we here? And then there were various, you know, opinions and there were various papers that were written. And, and I thought it was funny that, you know, for thousands of years we've been asking the question, why am I here, when it's answered in the Word of God in Colossians chapter 1. So at the end of this, we will know exactly why we are here and what we were supposed to do. And then with that knowledge, you can pass it on to your friends and you can pass it on to your family. And you can find meaning in your own life because some people struggle with why am I here, what is the purpose of my life. Colossians chapter 1 actually answers that for you. Before I get started with that, though, I want to share, like this morning, uh, it's one of those things, like if you, we all like routines, right? We all have a, a, a daily routine that we're comfortable with or whatever, and, and being coming a Christian doesn't change the fact that we like routines, but I always thought it was kind of funny how on Sunday morning, I get random text messages during the actual service, and it's, it's funny because I think everybody that I know knows that I'm a pastor, and everybody that I know knows that I'm committed to being at church on Sunday morning, and, and, I, and I don't respond to those text messages when they're coming in during the service because I'm here. Uh, but it was, just, it was funny this morning because I got one at like 1026, which is when I should be in uh, Sunday school. I didn't happen to be in Sunday school because I was playing with baby Callum. Sorry, I was babysitting. <laughs> I was operating the nurse, nursery effectively. That's what I was doing. <clears throat> 
<laughs> yeah, that's the truth. So, uh, at 1026, I got a text message from somebody that said, uh, Brother Claude, can we meet with you? Uh, and I'm not going to use any names. My girlfriend and I just wanted to, to talk. I said, okay, that's great. When did you want to meet? And they said, well, how about 12 or 1230? <laughs> I never count on being done at 12 o'clock. I don't. I don't know if you guys count on me being done at noon or not, but I never count on being done. So I I told the the young person, I said, uh, how about 2 o'clock? That's a little better. Uh, So they came up and they met with me at 2 o'clock today. And and, and it's it's one of those things that uh, this was a young man who was in our youth group at one point, but it has sort of fallen out. This kind of the, the modern track where they grow to be a certain age, they graduate high school, and they just quit coming to church. Uh, but he's in a relationship with a young lady, and the young lady said that she was saved several years ago, but she never followed up with baptism, and she wanted to know if she could get baptized and and what the process for baptism would be. So I explained the practice of baptism and the importance of it and then asked a few questions, and then we talked about what that process would look like. So maybe Wednesday night I'll introduce you to the young lady, and you'll you'll know the young man And it's just one of those things that I share. Like sometimes I just wonder, what do people think I do? (laughs) So Colossians chapter 1, going back to that, like what are we supposed to do? Why are we here? All right, now. No, no, don't take him out. Just bring him up here. Cope. Woohoo! Nothing. And yet if I want him to be quiet, he won't do it. Oh, I forgot. That's Hannah's child. <laughs> a long line of following the rules, right, Hannah? <laughs> you guys all know her grandmother. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to ask Brother Danny, would you mind saying a prayer for our service? Amen. Okay. Thank you very much, Brother Danny. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 1. This is going to flow pretty easy because these first couple of verses are really just an introduction. uh, And I think most of you are familiar with this introduction, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking deep theology. Uh, Brother Dan, if you have some deep theology you want to interject in verses 1 or 2, that'd be great. Otherwise, it's pretty basic. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ... By the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Paul's writing the letter to the church at Colossae. And he's including Timothy, one of the brothers, as being included in this. Verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I I love this. So he's writing a letter, and what does he say? He says, grace and peace to you from God. So in this particular instance, you have to understand, if he's writing a letter to the church, and he's praying for them to have grace and peace, then this gives us a pretty good indication of what we should do when we interact with other Christians. I, I love this because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't necessarily think about it like this in the modern world. In the modern world, we have our church, and then there is the other church, and then the other church. And we don't really correspond back and forth. But in this particular instance, Paul's writing a letter to the church, and he's saying, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. He's encouraging his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ with grace and peace. Verse 3. We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He's writing to a church, and he's saying that we are always praying for you. How often do we think about that in our daily walk? Do we pray for the church that's down the street? Do we pray for the cowboy church? Do we pray for the Methodist church to hold fast to the word of God? Do we pray for First Baptist Church to make sure that they're doing okay? Or do we get so consumed with our daily walk that we will just be consumed within our own small circles and forget to pray for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? They need our prayer because they're struggling with all the same things that we're struggling with. So if you're, give, if you're given an opportunity to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be doing that. The question is, are we? We're not at point one yet. We're going on to verse four. It's going to go really easy. 
since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. We're praying for you. Why? Because we heard you're Christian. We've been praying for you since when? Since we heard you were Christian. Well, come on, Lori. But what about me? She's always worried about herself. Doesn't care about me at all. How am I going to play with the baby if she's sitting in the cry room? I got Callum. <laughs> and he blows bubbles. <clears throat> so he's writing this letter to the church. He's telling them that since they've heard that they were Christians, that he's been praying for them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is encouraging, inspiring, because we know people, we do, we know people, John walked the aisle today and surrendered his life to Christ. He's a new brother in Christ. We have an opportunity to pray for him. Why? Because he's a new brother in Christ. Why else? Because we know when you make that profession of faith, the devil, whoo, the devil gets on you hard to try and distract you from doing the things that God wants you to do. So we have an opportunity. We're going to be able to pray for John all week this week, and we're going to be able to lift him up. Why? Because we heard he is a brother in Christ. He joined us this morning. Verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Why are we praying for you? We're praying for you because we heard you're a Christian. How do we know you're a Christian? Because we know that you heard the word. And the word is all that is necessary in order to convict people of their sin and convince them to call out for Jesus. Woohoo! Amen. The word of God is enough to encourage people to surrender their lives to Christ. That's powerful. You carry the Bible around. Just hand it to somebody. Just watch the Bible. Do its work. <clears throat> Just understand that in this particular instance, he's writing a letter to the church. He's telling them that they're praying for them. Why are they praying for them? Because they heard their brothers in Christ. How did they hear? Through the word. The same word. We understand you were saved by the same word that saved us. So we're praying for you. Verse 6. which has come to you as it also has in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we have six verses of, Hi, my name's Paul. I'm praying for you because I heard you heard the word of God. And that word is powerful enough that it convicted you and it convicted us. So now we see the word of God is bringing forth fruit. Do you notice here that he doesn't take credit for the fruit? He doesn't say, I'm so glad you heard the word that I sent to you. I'm so glad you heard the word that I preached. He's just saying, I'm so glad you heard the word. The word was powerful enough to bear fruit in your life. And now... I'm praying for you. That word, ladies and gentlemen, is still powerful to do that today. The word of God is powerful enough to bring people to the understanding that they are sinners and that Jesus Christ is their salvation. All we have to do is share the word. But Paul's not taking credit for sharing the word. He's not giving Timothy credit for sharing the word. He's just saying, because you have accepted the word, because you are now a Christian, we're going to be praying for you because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Point number one. That always seems louder on Sunday night than it does Sunday morning. <laughs> be thankful for your fellow Christians. Think about that for a second. Be thankful for your fellow Christians. Like if you guys weren't here, I would be preaching to a camera. <clears throat> if your friends weren't here, you would be sitting here by yourself. These are people who have heard the word of God, have responded to the word of God, and they have shown up because they want you to know that they're also concerned for you the same way Paul was concerned for the church at Colossae. In this particular instance, he's giving us an insight into reference to how we should interact with other Christians and our compassion we should have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just in Colossae, but think about those brothers and sisters we have all over this county, let's just say Cass County, 
And then all over the world, they heard the word of God the same way we heard the word of God. We responded, they responded. We are all on a track to get to heaven. We should all be encouraging, lifting each other up, and praying for each other. Because, ladies and gentlemen, whoo, it is a dangerous world out there. It is dark, and they don't want you to understand that you have the love and the support of anybody. But we, as a church, have support from the entire church. That means if we're all doing what Paul is teaching the first century Christians to do, then there are people right now in Africa that are praying for us. There are people in India right now praying for us. There are people in Russia right now praying for us. There are people in China that are praying for us. And they don't even have the freedoms we have to build a church. They're hiding out in their home churches, worried about whether or not someone's going to catch on to the fact that there's a couple of them meeting together. And they're praying for us. So we should, in turn, ladies and gentlemen, appreciate those prayers and then reciprocate those prayers as often as possible. We have people to pray for all around the world every day that we haven't even met yet, but we will come to know in heaven through all eternity. Verse number seven. As you also learn from Ephraim, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Verse eight. Sorry, too many times who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Now, he's getting personal here. I heard from Ephraim, you guys received the word of Christ, and it made me so happy. I want you to know I'm writing this letter to tell you that I'm praying for you. Do you think that Paul had anything else he could have been doing? <laughs> Do you think that maybe he could have been, I don't know, traveling on a journey? He liked to travel a lot, didn't he? <laughs> Do you think that maybe he could have been writing a letter to a different church? Do you think that maybe he could have been settling the disturbance amongst the twelve? Do you think that maybe he could have been worried about or concerned about the people who were right there in his, his local proximity? But no, he took the time to sit down and pen this letter to a church so that they would know that he was praying for them. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to encourage you to take some action this week that's outside of our normal routine. I'm trying to encourage you to think of that person that needs to hear you're praying for them and to go ahead and pen them a letter. Let's just be honest. I'd be happy if you send them a text message and say I'm praying for you. <clears throat> you can still send them an email for anybody that still uses email. <laughs> you can still use the U.S. Postal Service if you want to. But think about how blessed we are to sit here in an air-conditioned building on a Sunday night to have this conversation that there are Christians all over the world that could use some encouragement. And think about how good it would feel for us if we received this letter from Paul that just says, Hey, I want you to know I heard you received the word, and I'm so happy for you. He took the time to write this letter to teach us something, ladies and gentlemen. And so far, we're eight verses in, and all we really know is that he took the time to write this letter because he's happy that somebody else received Christ. Woohoo! Somebody got saved. And that made me happy. Verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Not only am I praying for you, but I'm doing it daily. Not only am I doing it daily, but just all the time I'm thinking about the fact that you're saved and it brings me such joy. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. Brother John could use those prayers this week. Amen? Amen. He could. <clears throat> Continuing in verse 9. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
The second half of verse 9 is something I think we need to go ahead and put an asterisk next to. Because I want you to know I'm about to give you a reason to reference the second half of verse 9. You can go ahead and put an asterisk next to all of verse 9. It's all good stuff. But in that second half, ladies and gentlemen, he says, And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In this particular instance, we don't know a whole lot about Paul's interactions with Colossae. We don't. We just know that he heard from somebody that they heard the word of God and they got saved. We can... We can we can understand that from just the verses that we've read. And then he says, this is what I'm praying for you, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his wisdom. He doesn't know these people, maybe. Maybe never met these people. And he's writing them a letter to say, I'm praying for you to have the wisdom of God and the spiritual understanding. He's writing a letter to a church to tell them, I'm so happy you're saved. Now I'm praying that you will receive the wisdom of God. I want you to understand that because point number two was just this. Thank you, Virgil. When you don't know what to pray, man, verse 9 is a pretty good prayer. When you don't know what it is a person needs, you can pray for them to be filled with all of the wisdom and spiritual knowledge of God. Woohoo! Think about how great this world would be if we were all praying for the people that we know that need the spiritual wisdom and knowledge of God. And then all of a sudden, God just answered that prayer in the affirmative. And now all of the people who are making our lives terrible are filled with the spiritual knowledge and wisdom of God. Why? Because that's what we prayed for. And that's the will of God that people would come to know Christ. And Scripture says that if we ask anything in His will, then it shall be answered. So what's stopping the world from coming to the understanding of the spiritual knowledge of God? Ladies and gentlemen, we're not praying for it. Think about it. Don't just tell me I'm wrong. Go home and try it for a while, and then come back and tell me I'm wrong. We have the ability to influence the world today the same way Paul was trying to influence the world in the first century. And what was he doing? He said, I heard that you heard the word, so I'm praying that you would be filled with all of the knowledge and spiritual wisdom of God. Bless you. I'm okay if you pray that prayer for me every day. I'm actually okay if you pray that prayer for me a couple of times a day. And think about it. Wouldn't you be okay with other people praying that exact same thing for you? That you were filled with the spiritual knowledge and information of God? Knowledge of God? Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, all of a sudden, it becomes a life verse. What are you doing, Brother Claude? I'm praying for you. What are you praying? I'm praying that you have all of the wisdom and spiritual understanding of God. That's, that's an awful lot of responsibility, isn't it? It will be for you. <laughs> because once they have all of that spiritual knowledge and understanding of God, what do you think their responsibility is going to be to that? Man, I've got to pray for somebody. I've got to pray for somebody else to have the knowledge and spiritual understanding of God. Think about how different our daily walk would be if everyone we encountered was filled with all of the knowledge and spiritual understanding of God. Think about how different politics would be. Woo! Those commercials are coming, ladies and gentlemen. It's October now. We're about to start getting those commercials. I, I never miss those commercials when they're gone. And I've never seen one of them that was focused on the spiritual knowledge and understanding of God. So let's pray for these people. Let's pray for those people that God has placed in positions of power and authority above us so they would be filled with his spiritual knowledge and understanding. <coughs> Couldn't hurt, could it? Worst case scenario, they get saved. <clears throat> Best case scenario, we see them in heaven forever and ever and ever because we said a prayer that changed their lives. Verse 10. that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. It's the continuation of the prayer. Or is it the response once the prayer has been answered in the affirmative? 
I'm praying that you would have all the spiritual wisdom and understanding of God. And then when that happens, you will walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. It works either way. How you, either way. It does. But for me, I love it as being the response. I love it as just seeing Paul's praying for a church. He doesn't know exactly what to pray for, so he prays that they would have the spiritual wisdom and understanding of God. And then he looks forward into the future and he sees that God has answered that prayer because it's the will of God. And that those people that he's praying for are now walking worthy of the Lord, pleasing him and being fruitful in every good work. It's the perfect prayer for spreading the gospel. I'm going to pray that you're filled with the spiritual knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God. And I know that's the will of God that you have that. And he's going to answer that. And then you are going to start to walk fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. You want to see revival start? Let's pray. Let's pray for each other that we would all be filled with the spiritual wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of God. And then let's watch and see if we don't all begin to be more fully committed to pleasing Him. It is an opportunity for you to keep a prayer journal, to write down a prayer you really want to see answered, and then come back to that prayer and check it off when you see that God said, yes, I'm answering this one. I don't know any you keep prayer journals, but it's a good idea. Verse 11. Sorry. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. That's why I believe it's a response to the prayer. He says, I've, I've watched and I've seen now you becoming more fully in line with his word and you're pleasing him. And that that strengthens you with all might according to his glorious power. And you're able to be patient and long-suffering with joy. Fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit that we talked about this morning that don't come into your heart until you receive Christ. And then it generates these results. Verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in the light. I'm praying for you because I heard you were saved. I don't know what you need, so I'm going to pray for you to have all the wisdom and spiritual understanding of God. I'm going to watch that change your life, and I'm going to realize that that makes us brothers in Christ. And as your brother, we share the same inheritance. We're going to see the same king. We're going to live in the same eternity. We're going to spend together forever in the presence of God. Because we prayed for each other to have all the wisdom and understanding of God. This isn't part of the sermon. Let's stop and do that now. Let's just have this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we don't want to come into your house, read your word, and then leave, dear Lord, without taking it into our hearts and our minds. So I pray, dear God, for those of us who are here, for those of us that are watching on the video, for those of us, dear Lord, that are reading through Colossians chapter 1, we will take it into our heart that Paul was serious about this prayer, and we would pray it now for each other, that you would, dear God, fill this room with your power and your presence, and you would impart all of your wisdom and all of your spiritual understanding on this, your chosen people, so we can, dear Lord, live lives more fully and pleasing to you. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom 
of the son of his love. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm praying for you because you're a Christian. I'm praying that God gives you all of his wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then I see that that imparts your life. And it impacts you. And it makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're both going to heaven. We're both going to heaven. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, you don't know if Paul's ever met these people or if he's ever going to meet these people. You just know he wrote a letter. And you know specifically that he wrote a letter. Why? Because he heard from one of his disciples that they had been there and that those people had heard the word of God and that they had become Christians. So I don't know if Paul was there before or if Paul was after or if Paul never went there. Not from just reading this section of scripture. So reading this section of scripture, we see that Paul was so inspired because he heard someone was a Christian that he's calling to them to have all of the wisdom and spiritual understanding of God so that they can be united in the kingdom work forever and ever. There are people right now in Tanzania, in India, in Australia, even in Alaska where it's cold, that need this prayer so they can become brothers and sisters in Christ with us and we can serve God together forever and ever and all eternity. We just have to get outside of our little comfortable bubble and start to understand that there are people in the world that are struggling with things, ladies, you and I are not currently struggling with. Beautiful weather in East Texas this morning. Clear blue skies. It's not raining, it's not snowing, and we're not in the middle of a drought. We're sitting in an air-conditioned building, reading the Word of God, with no care or concern for anyone coming through the door to take us to jail. But there are people in the world that don't have that blessing, and they need our prayer. Verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You see how he just went... He went from, I'm praying for you, to here's the gospel. We're saved together through his blood for the, gift, for the forgiveness of our sins. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Of course he's talking about Jesus, because that's all he does. Now, verse 16 is the one you put an asterisk next to. Verse 16 is the one you underline. Verse 16 is the answer to the question, why are you here? Verse 16 is the one answer to that question, why are we all here? Why are any of us here? How did we get here? Where did it begin and why? Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Outsmarts Aristotle and all the sages and all their wisdom with just the simple understanding from Paul. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created. All things that are in heaven and that are on earth, all things that are visible and all things that are invisible were created. Why? They were created Continuing in verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. Why are we here, ladies and gentlemen? We are here because God created us in his image for his glory. How do we give glory to God? We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they can be full of of all the knowledge and spiritual wisdom of God. Why are we here? To bring glory to God. Why do you not feel like that that's the answer you were looking for? Some people just like things to be more complicated than they are. Some people don't want to admit that there's a God that's in control, so they don't want to admit that they were created for anything other than their own personal glory. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 is the word of God recorded in the first century by the Apostle Paul so that we would know we were created by God for the glory of God. And that's the only answer that we need to know. Point number three. Oops, I turned it off. Point number three. 
You were created by God and for God. Now the challenge is, live like that. <laughs> live like you were created by God for the glory of God. Live like that and pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can all be filled with the spiritual wisdom and knowledge of God. So that we can all be more faithful in our walk. So that we can all be better examples of him who created us. And then we can all go to heaven together and say, hey, I'm glad you're here. And the more people we share that with, ladies and gentlemen, the more opportunity we have to facilitate that being the truth. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a moment in time to read through your word. I pray that it stays in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits, dear God, and that you would fill us with all your wisdom and spiritual understanding so we can, dear Lord, be better examples of who you created us to be. Amen.